And while you uh, start answering this, uh, I think it's time for us to start this session because we don't have a lot of time here today and we have a lot of interesting speakers that we want to get to. So welcome to the last day of the CIANI annual meeting. Today we will discuss uh, youth in food systems. Uh, my name is Jonathan and I work as a network coordinator at the Stockholm Environment Institute. Uh, and there I work for Siani and I have been responsible for developing the work stream on the topic of youth. Uh, and Siani has worked with youth for quite some time. But when I got in now, uh, we want to emphasize this work even more. Uh, and I'm here to, to coordinate this work. And even though I worked in issues related to food systems for a few years now, uh, I've been studying food systems as well. I feel like the more I read, the more there is to learn about it. Uh, it's just growing. There's so many different actors. There's so many different aspects to bring into this. Uh, and today we're going to focus on youth. And because it is such a complex system that we're talking about, I'm extremely happy that we have such a a great panel with us today. Uh, they will share their experiences and their knowledge about food systems and working in food systems. Uh, but I also want to highlight already here that you in the audience, you're also extremely important for this discussion. You also have your experiences, you have questions to come with, uh, and you might also have ideas for this topic. So please share that in the chat uh, as we go along and we'll try to get to as many of them as we possibly can. Uh, some of you have also emailed your questions in beforehand, and I will also try to get to those. But already now, it would be very good if you guys wanted to write in the chat uh, what, um, where you're calling in from today, because we want to see the diversity of the Siani network. Uh, I see someone calling in here from Tanzania already, uh, and it's just great for our speakers to also see this. With us today, we have Amanda Wood, who is from the Stockholm Resilience Center. We have Sana Bannar from uh, Sami Nora, which is a Sami youth organization. We have Thomas Rosval, who is uh, a member of the high level panel of experts on food security and nutrition. And we have Maureen Muketa, who is the founder of the NGO Tule Viema. And at the end of this session, we have Katarina Wahlgren, who will give the concluding remarks. And she's from the Swedish Ministry of Enterprise and Innovation. And we will first hear intervention from our speakers. And then before we go into a discussion, we will um, have a short little break of two minutes where you can just stretch your legs. Um, but first, we will hear now from our speakers. But before we get going, I wanted to let you know that we are recording this session. So if you do not want to appear in this recording, you should turn off your camera now. But I think we should stop sharing this Memti now uh, and go to our first speaker, who is Amanda Wood, uh, and she is a researcher at the Stockholm Resilience Center. Uh, Amanda, the screen is yours. So now you should see some slides. Yes. yes. Great. So hello, everyone. I'm Amanda Wood, a researcher at the Stockholm Resilience Center. Thanks so much for having me today. Uh, my work focuses on really trying to bridge science and practice in order to create more sustainable food systems, and I work in the Nordic region. So I've been asked to speak here today, maybe not because of my own stellar record with youth engagement, but hopefully I can share what I have learned and highlight other groups that can give us all some inspiration. However, because I am a researcher, I'm going to start out by giving an evidence-based justification for why involving youth in, in food systems is so important. So we know that it's essential that food systems change. Simply put, if we keep on a business as usual path, in other words, we keep consuming, producing and wasting food as we do today, then we're looking at a grim future. So here we're seeing the warning signs of a great acceleration in food systems towards a very undesirable future where malnutrition is on the rise, where environmental impacts from agriculture is rising, where resource use needed for agriculture is rising, and where there's increasing negative health impacts. So why does this point to involving youth? Well, there are really many reasons, but I'll just focus on two. 
So first, young people are feeling these very negative impacts now. So for example, one in five children and adolescents around the world are overweight or obese. And this is largely because of our current food system, the foods we produce, the way it's marketed and priced, uh, the food environments they live in, the pervasiveness of fast food and so on. But also young people are going to continue to feel these negative effects far into the future. So food systems are built on a number of what we call slow variables. And this is just really a fancy way of saying that what we do right now, for better or for worse, might only be felt in years to come. So climate change and soil fertility are classic examples. So these aren't taps that we can just turn on or turn off. It's gonna take decades sometimes to see change. So young people can't just wait to grow up, get our jobs and then vote current food systems out. Yet their voices are currently often marginalized from decision-making processes that are shaping these food systems, both to, of today and of tomorrow. So I'll touch on one project that I've been involved with and share my insights. This project was called Toward Sustainable Food Systems in the Nordic Region. And it was a project based around stakeholder input. So asking food system actors, people involved in the food system, how they wanted to see the future of food. Since we were talking about future food systems, it seemed only fitting that young people would be there. And we hosted multi-stakeholder dialogues across the Nordics where a range of actors, as you can see here, including youth came together to discuss these food futures. And what did we learn from this? So the, it was really rewarding. The young people who were able to join were very enthusiastic to participate. Uh, one reason was because they had a chance to meet new networks and because they had a chance to be part of something they aren't usually invited to. Um, it was also a chance for us to ingest, inject some fresh ideas into the conversation. So for example, we had a young farmer or some working with startups and this really brought new perspectives to the conversations of usual suspects. Um, but there were also some challenges. So practically speaking, the timing of the dialogues just simply did not work for many youth. So they were on the weekdays during a whole day and where you and I can take time out of our work to come to meetings like we are right now. For youth, this often clashes with work schedules or um, with exams and so forth. And similarly, while you and I usually have no problem getting our companies to cover travel costs, we did need to budget that in for youth, um, which we are able to do where needed, um, but not something that we had originally thought of. We also struggled with this concept of avoiding a representative youth. So all young people are different and unlike every other person at our dialogue, they don't represent a specific sector. Um, so we did struggle with that. And it was sometimes in certain countries difficult for us to find youth voices to engage. Yet in other countries, it was a lot easier. And that's because we had already had networks that we engaged with. So one network that uh, we reached out to was the Regeneration 2030 network. This is a platform that was developed by young people around the Nordic, Nordic and Baltic regions. And they're taking action to make sure we actually do deliver on the SDGs. So I got to know Region when they invited me to host one of their thematic groups during their summer summit. So over several pretty intense days, we discussed the evidence base. I heard their visions for food systems and it culminated in them deciding to write a position statement of this vision, which then I passed along to the Nordic Council of Ministers. So I learned some very valuable lessons from this experience. So one, I learned we probably all have doors that we can easily open. So for example, I work with the Nordic Council of Ministers and for me, it was really nothing to send this position statement forward. Um, but for some of the people at the conference, they were later than invited to be on panels with Nordic Council and so forth. So we can all kind of think what doors are easy for us to open. I think I also saw we need to find a, a balance between 
empowering young people to bring forth new ideas and expecting young people to have all the answers. So one participant I talked to at this summit had almost a frustration that they knew they wanted more sustainable food systems and decision makers should be doing more, but how were they expected to have all the specific solutions when they weren't the only, when they weren't the policy expert, the agricultural expert, or the nutrition expert? So I often hear this sentiment, oh, the young generation, they're going to be the savior, they're going to save the, save the planet. Uh, but we have a really big role, not only in what we do now, but also in equipping these young people with the knowledge, the resources, and the platforms they need to actually be able to live up to that expectation. As I mentioned, I also learned that it's better if you engage uh, and build relationships if you want to um, engage young people in, in research. So having those long-term relationships is key. And I also learned, again, for those researchers out there, that giving your time and your expertise to these groups is rewarding, and it's one of the most tangible things that we can do to feed young people's interest in food systems. So we can probably all think of a group to connect with, even in some small way. So for example, here in Sweden, the researcher's desk asks researchers to give street lectures um, to the Fridays for Future group um, focused on climate. You've probably heard of them. And so, for example, I've given a street lecture on food and climate, all small things that we can do. Switching to projects that I'm not involved with, but had the pleasure of getting to know, and I hope they can give you some inspiration. One of these projects is called the Co-Create Project, and this was developed by about 14 research and advocacy institutions. It aims to reduce the increasing burden of overweight and obesity among adolescents that I mentioned earlier. And it does this by asking young people what kinds of policies make sense to them. So in this project, they developed a model for multi-actor dialogue that really enabled adolescents to discuss directly with decision makers and businesses in a very inclusive, safe and actionable way. I've already mentioned the Nordic Council of Ministers so they've put younger voices at the center of many of their strategies like generation 2030 strategy. And just making this explicit in your high level strategies then opens up all sorts of opportunities. So for example, they framed a lot of their climate action week for COP25, which did have a big focus on food, which is why I was there. But they focused this a lot around youth engagement. So this was an interesting way to turn what could otherwise be a very high level and inaccessible event into a platform for youth to really be on stage and take a prominent role. And finally, I see time is running out. Um, I just want to highlight WWF also has awesome platforms for youth engagement. And if you're interested in food specifically, you can check out the Eat for Change program. A large part is focused on building knowledge, awareness, and capacity of younger people to support sustainable food systems. So I'm gonna wrap up here and, and just summarize that some of the rewards of engaging youth in, in research is we, we do have this responsibility to raise marginalized voices. Uh, we can provide this platform and interest for longer term interest in food systems. We can help build and grow new ideas. And for anyone who has worked with these um, individuals, you can see easily how you would benefit from their boundless energy and drive. A few challenges, again, are avoiding these representatives of youth, ensuring empowerment versus expectation, uh, being sensitive to youth needs in terms of timing, schedules, and costs, and making sure we have the resources to actually engage long term. So finally, if you're a researcher, you can offer your expertise to these groups. And if you do engage them in your research, make sure that the activities are youth sensitive. For funders, um, allow funding for this long-term youth engagement because it, most researchers are not funded to do this as part of their job. For education boards, make sure that food is in the curriculum early to start growing that interest in food systems. And for policymakers, you have the ability to open up spaces for youth engagement. So I'll end there. Hopefully I haven't gone too far over, but no, thank you fine. very much. Thank you so much, Amanda. Uh, a very interesting uh, presentation.
Um, and it's, it connects a lot to how we have discussed about youth here at Siani as well, about how to treat youth as an actor and not just to have them uh, represented. Uh, and this comes quite natural to us as we always engage in these kind of multi-stakeholder dialogues here at Siani. Uh, and you're researching on the transformation of food systems. Uh, and I wanted to hear your thoughts more about like how, how do you bring in actors into this transformation that we want to see? And, how can we ensure that we incorporate also marginalized groups in this transformation? Yeah, great question. So this is incredibly important. It, it is also very challenging. Um, as I said, there's a lot of limitations on researchers in terms of what their time is supposed to go to, how they're funded, and they're generally we're not funded to reach out to stakeholders. So this is because we're all very interested in, in doing this. Um, so I think for researchers themselves, I think making the effort to try to establish these relationships and I'll admit I could do much better than I have, um, but that's important. And then also structurally, uh, I think with research institutions and funders, there needs to be a bit more structural support to um, support these long-term engagement efforts. Great, thank you. And I see that there are questions coming into the chat now and I have my colleague Ebba here that will uh, try to look for the best questions and then we will come back to them later in this session. So don't worry, we will try to get as many as possible answered. Thank you so much, Amanda. And we're moving quickly now from these broader perspectives given by Amanda to uh, Marie uh, Muketa. Marie is a young Kenyan. She's a nutritionist uh, that is fighting hunger and she's the founder of Tuleviema, which is a community-based organization focusing on nutrition and food insecurity in Kenya. Maureen, welcome. Maureen, I wonder if you are muted because we can't see Okay, you. There we are. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Jonathan, for your introduction and Amanda for such a pleasant conversation. I kept nodding through your presentation. Uh, yes, I'm happy to take you through my presentation. Um, so next slide. Um, so the question we are asking ourselves is how to engage the youth. And before we um, start discussing on how to engage the youth, I thought it is very important for us to understand what this food systems is, what the talk is all about food systems and why food systems are important. So food systems uh, encompasses a range of actors that are interlinked. That means um, adding activities involved in production, aggregation, processing, distribution, consumption, and disposal of food products that originate not only from agriculture, but forestry, fisheries, and other parts of the broader economic, societal, and environments in which they are embedded. So when we are talking about food systems, we're basically talking about um, how food is grown from the farm until it gets to the plate or the fork. Next. Uh, so the question is, why must youth be involved? And uh, a very interesting fact is that one third of the total population, which is about 2.3 billion people, um, is between, so the age group of those, uh, the, a third of the population is between 15 to 34 years. So these are people who are very energetic and have, um, building back a stronger food system this means we're building back a stronger food system not only for the current generation but also for the the young generation and also those who are to come before us uh, after us so it is important for youth to be involved because um of the life that is ahead of us uh like we have if i am to speak like that like a longer period of time to integrate to um Inter integrate with the upcoming food system to the stronger food system. And about 80% of these young people live in developing countries. So um, the other thing is that most of the world's food is produced by the age, by aging and small farm, small, smallholder farmers in developing countries. And the challenge with this is that older farmers are less likely to adopt new technologies that are needed to sustainably increase agricultural productivity and the fast evolving food value chain to ultimately feed the growing world population while protecting its environment. Next slide. So how do we ensure that youth are central in transformation of um, 
a sustainable food system and a stronger food system now that COVID-19 has clearly shown the gaps that exist. So one of the ways is to equip uh, with, to equip the youth with knowledge on the different value entry on the different value chain entry points that exist. So whenever we are talking about food systems, we are not only talking about the um, ag production point of view. There's production, there's distribution, there's processing. So the food value chain that exists, we need to equip the youth and make the youth know that um, it's food systems is not only about cultivating or growing the food, but they can align themselves in the different parts that exist in the value chain and also to improve the value chain image. So uh, this, so most of the time you find that agricultural professions are viewed less than, are viewed less and not as exciting and as appealing as corporate professions. So um, this is a significant barrier to getting younger generations to get involved in, in building more inclusive and resilient food systems that needs to be addressed. So we, the narrative of agriculture or um, the food value chain being seen as um, dirty job or uh, jobs that are not exciting, um, we need to change the narrative, that narrative. And one of the ways of changing the narrative is talking about the different value chains that exist and also uh, different ways in which youth can get involved. Next slide, please. Um, another way in which we can get youth to be, this, to be at the central of building back a stronger food system is to incorporate nutrition and agriculture in the school curriculum. So um, we usually say, okay, so once we start exposing children at a very young age to what nutrition is all about and what agriculture is all about, um, from primary school all the way to high school and even the tertiary school uh, level of education, they'll be able to start appreciating um, the importance of even the food they consume and how they can be able to appreciate this importance is by including modules of growing as well as marketing and consumption of nutritious foods. So nutrition and agriculture should not be a topic that um, once these children have grown up is when they're starting to hear about nutrition and why it is important to eat well, but it needs to be cultivated in them as they grow uh, from a very young age, they need to know why it is important to eat um, healthy foods and what healthy foods are, and um, uh, how to oh, yeah how to define healthy foods. Uh, and then this could also help young people see nutrition and agriculture as career potentials. So you find because the, the they'll be introduced to these modu modules very early in life, they'll be able to start. So um, we'll be able to train their minds to see they don't to be um to be successful in life you don't need to sit in the in an office um in a well-conditioned office and wait for people to come and see you you working also in the farm or along the value chain you can be a distributor you can be a processor uh, to help um, in making nutritious foods available is also a good enough career next slide the other way is also to ensure that we strengthen higher education in agriculture and nutrition. So relatively few students choose to study agriculture and nutrition. This is because taught materials are not linked to technology and uh, facilitate innovation that have greater relevance to diverse and evolving agricultural and nutrition uh, in the nutrition sector. So agriculture needs to be to have a focus on agribusiness and entrepreneurship. One of the reasons why youth are not involved in, um, do not find the food value system, value chain appealing is because most agricultural practices uh, and farming, most of farming, most of these farming uh, technology, um, farming activities, food really takes time to grow. But now with technology, we need to embrace uh, the use of new technology and new science as Amanda Wood has talked about where we can be able to use very high species, um, very high quality of seeds that one do not suffer from a pest resistant and uh, have a faster maturation period so that uh, they can be able, they want a high return on investment uh, activity and also um, to build technical skills and building capacity for management, decision making, communication and leadership should be at the central of this education. So the students should not only be taught to be 
quote unquote the doers, but they can also be taught management skills and also decision making skills and communication, which they, which will enable and equip them to um, to start doing businesses along the value chain. And also, so this how these reforms can be done is by ensuring that young people are directly engaged in the process um, of curriculum review and curriculum build up. Next slide. Uh -huh. So another way we can engage the youth is to seek their participation and welcome them to the, the decision making table and not only welcoming them, but also listening to them and involving them in designing the pro projects or policies, implementation and also monitoring and evaluation. Be this by doing this will be giving them an, you'll be giving us an opportunity to speak and also give ideas of how we think we can be able to build back a stronger food system because uh, we say solutions for us and no solutions for us without us. And the other way is to develop youth specific programs. So youth specific programs means uh, intentionally targeting programs that youth will be included and also um, programs where youth are the target audience of uh, the program that is being implemented. And as Amanda said, not just getting youth representatives, but also youth who are passionate about um, the food systems, the food systems, and you could be passionate, but you don't know how to go about it. These people, this kind, this category of youth also needs to be involved because with just a little bit of mentorship and a little bit of capacity building, they'll be where they want to be. So what are the challenges youth engaged in food systems experience? One of the challenge we face is exclusion and omission um, on the decision making table. So you will find uh, most of the time when policies are being implemented, youth are not there, but um, I, I commend the upcoming UN Food System Summit where in at least every, the five, the five action tracks, there is a vice chair who is a youth. So giving us an opportunity to sit at the table and also contribute and um, yeah, also contribute and be part of the policy implementation and policy making. And the other challenge that youth face, um, the youth face while engaging in the food system is lack of finances either to start or expand. So you find most of the time um, because youth are, do not have um, like property, most of the youth do not have property where they can use um, to get uh, security, for, for example, like for financing, they, own, they are able to do very little with a, a little pocket money they are able to save. So this means even when, even if they wanted to expand and maybe like increase um, the amount of land they're tilling or even expand like buy a, 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 a a cold truck to transport very uh, delicate food like vegetables and fruits, they are not able to do this. So um, lack of finances to start either to start a, a, a business or uh, expand their businesses and also lack of access to current best practices. Lack of access to current best practices, um, which could either be in terms of they do not have um, uh, access to either internet where they can be able to engage with other youth from different parts of the country to be able to see the best practices that uh, are currently being uh, practiced or also they totally do not know that this new technology that has come up that um, can be able to uh, help them in whatever programs or activities they are engaged in in the food value system chain and also inadequate mentorship and capacity building. This was really echoed very well by Amanda when she said there are people who want to, they have the will to do, but do not know how to do it. Uh, so with just a little bit of mentorship, um, youth will be there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maureen. Uh, wow, what a really, really interesting presentation. Uh, I look forward to continue this discussion later today as well. Uh, but I mentioned before that you were the founder of Tule Viema, uh, and I was hoping that you could give us just a, an overview of what you're doing and how are you engaging youth in your work? 
Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Yes, uh, I'm the founder of Tuleviema. So what we do at Tuleviema is we raise awareness of proper feeding practices um, through holding nutrition health talks and training young women of reproductive age to cultivate vertical gardens, indigenous vegetables on vertical gardens. So how we engage the youth is uh, one, the young women whom we work with, most of them, they are still within the youth age bracket. And also the nutrition health talks that we hold we really call out um, for youth to either participate in arranging of these uh, uh, nutrition health talks. And we also work with youth groups uh, uh, in my community. So we reach out to the leaders, the youth group leaders and tell them, so this is a, there's a nutrition health talk that is coming up and we would like you to be part of it, not only in attendance, but also in um, coming up with a program of the nutrition health talk. Thank you. And we I see that there are questions coming into the chat. And as I said before, we will get back to those later. Uh, but now we're moving from one youth to another, and we're going back to Sweden, but we're going to the northern part of the country, to Sápmi, which is the land of the indigenous population Sami. And with us, we have Sana Vannar, and she is the chair of Sami Nora, which is the Sami youth organization. Uh, Sana, over to you. Yeah, hello. Uh... And hi from my car, it's like now 27 degrees cold. So I'm sitting in the car before I'm going out to the forest to my rangers. So I'm president of Sami Nora, a Sami Youth Association in Sweden, but I'm also a ranger herder in Sirikes community or Sirikes Sami in Jokkomokki in northern part of Sweden. Uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about ranger herding, but it's important to know that not all Sami people are ranger herders, but it is a big part of the Sami culture. And like ranger herder, we produce a lot of ranger meat that people eat and a lot of food. But for me, it's have, for me it have always been natural to like see the rangers, how they live, how they grown up and what they eat and then slaughter them. Some people, it says, they say, how oh, can you eat your own animals? But for me, it's better to eat my own animals because then I know what they have done, how they have lived and what they have eaten. And like we take everything from the reindeer. We are not throwing away, away anything. The skin and antlers, for example, are we having for Dodji, the Sami handicraft. Uh, we eat the meat the heart, the tongue, the blood, like we are taking everything. But we are seeing a problem that is coming more and more now. And that's how a lot of impacts are wanting to take the reindeer grazing areas. They want to have the same area as the reindeers are finding the food on. And some examples of that are road, rail, railroads, mines, hydroelectric power, forestry, predators, wind power, cities, ski slopes, tourists. You can make as list as long as you want to keep to things that when you want to take the ranger her, rangers grazing areas. And just this year and a lot of years before, we see how or which consequences this is going for the rangers like we produce a lot of meat but we could produce even more meat if we had if if predators doesn't have that take as much rangers as they does but also we have the road road and railroads that kills a lot of rangers and people are always ask me why do rangers go on roads and that's an easy answer because of course we have a lot of snow here and of course it's easier to walk on roads instead of snow so when it is so much snow then it's easier for the rangers to be on the road or instead of walking in the snow and then the car comes and then drive over the, over the rangers so a lot a lot of rangers are dying because the car or and train that are driving over the rangers that is a huge big problem we see now. 
And on top of this, we have the climate change. We have the, this very long list of things that are impacting reindeer, reindeer. And on top of that, we have the climate change that is the next problem. Like we see how the climate have changed and getting some ice sometimes under the snow and over the lichen. So the reindeer don't can find the food. And that means that they that they don't can find food and sometimes they die. And we need to supplement feed them. And we often heard that we need to eat like in this climate change time, we often heard that we need to eat more vegetables and uh, to not eat meat. But for me, it's better to eat local produce, pr produced things instead of flying food from the other from the other side of the world. Then it's better to eat local produced meat like reindeer meat that you know where the reindeers have gone and what they have done. But we also have this climate change and we know that we need to produce more energy and electricity. And we know that we have this kind of impacts on reindeer herding areas that are affecting us. But now we, they also want to put green energy. They call it green energy. But for me, it's not green because they put them on our lands without asking us if it's OK. And it means that our reindeers have even more more smaller place to, for them to search food for on. So it's a lot of problems that are connected to each other. But that one solution I can see is that companies and also families try to produce their own energy. But also their own food and eat more local produced food, for example, reindeer meat if it be in Sweden. Yeah, that was that. Thank you, Sanna. I think you're really touching upon the complexity of the food systems and how so many different aspects are playing in here. We're discussing to eat less meat, maybe we should eat more local. We're talking about how renewable energy actually interrupts the traditional food systems that you have uh, uh, up in Sápmi. Uh, but one aspect that we have talked about early this week as well in the Siani annual meeting uh, was the importance of the transfer of knowledge from older generations to younger generations, especially concerning indigenous practices and sustainable systems among indigenous populations. And I wanted to hear your thoughts uh, about this and how important do you think that this knowledge is and do you see challenges for Sami youth continuing with the traditional practices such as reindeer herding? Yeah, of course, we know like this knowledge and indigenous knowledge and traditional knowledge is so important to handle both the climate change, but I see them like connected with the food system. So both to handle the food system and climate change, we need this knowledge. And in this time with all the new te technology, we see that it's harder for youth to know the knowledge because indigenous knowledge, it's nothing you can read in a book. It's not, it's something you need to be outside and with the elders and talk to the elders to learn. But youths today have their phones, looking movies and have the social media. So they don't really have the time to sit, to talk with the old elders and to learn the things that they have to tell you. But we also have another problem, and that is that children and youth need to go to school. And of course, it's good to go to school, but you can also learn a lot of things with your elders that you don't can learn from the school. So, and also like today, the science is the highest, but I think we need to value the indigenous knowledge as same high, same high as science, because we need both of them to handle the future. So maybe we can, a solution can maybe be to like get youth and children free from school to follow elders, not just that they sit home, home, but they are following their parents, 
grandparents out to see how they have lived and how they can hand live in the nature. For example, one example is that in my area in Sahmi, we have a lot of names on places. And if you understand the, the names, then you also can understand in this lake, we can find this fish. And that's a really important knowledge. Yeah, thank you so much, Sana. Uh, I think we have a lot to get back here once we let the audience in with their questions as well. Um, and thank you for calling in uh, from your car. <laughs> we now have heard from two, you, two youth representatives and one researcher. And before we take a short leg stretcher and let you guys in to ask your questions, uh, I wanted to introduce you to our last speaker of this session. Uh, his name is Thomas Rosvald. And Thomas, he has a long experience working with issues related to agriculture, nutrition, and food security. And he's now a member of the high-level panel of experts on food and nutrition. Uh, Thomas, welcome. The screen is yours. Thank you very much. And I'll share my screen and hope it works. Okay, can you see the screen? Yes, it's, yeah, there we have it. Perfect, thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit uh, briefly about a report that's currently being prepared. Um, and it's promoting youth engagement and employment in agriculture and forestry. Uh, and this discussion comes very timely as it can provide input to the development of this report. Let me tell you what a high level panel of experts is. It is the science policy interface um, of the UN Committee on World Food Security. In 2009, there was a major reorganization in the UN system, and the Committee for World Food Security became a UN committee. And it's managed by FAO, IFAD, and the World Food Program. And the high-level panel of experts was appointed to ensure that the policy discussions were based on best available evidence. And it's important, as Sana just said, to, to include that not only scientific evidence, but also, for example, traditional knowledge. So the HLPE aims to facilitate policy debates and inform policy making by providing independent, um, comprehensive evidence-based analysis and advice. So that's the background. Our most recent report was published in June of 2020. And I mentioned this because it's a very important report in that it's looking forward towards 2030 when the sustainable development goals should hopefully, but uh, highly unlikely, be implemented. And it's on food security and nutrition, building a global narrative towards 2030. And it will be one of the major background documents informing the World Food System Summit later this year. I really recommend you to have a look at this report. I'll only mention one thing from the report, and that is that Traditionally, food security and the food system as including four dimensions. In this recent report, we are suggesting adding two. One is sustainability, which of course is self-evident. It should have been there uh, from earlier. But the other one, and more important for our discussion today, is agency. And agency is the capacity of individuals to independently and to make their own free choices and not only individuals but groups of individuals as well and this is why youth comes in as so important youth must be seen as an essential element of all people of course because they are our future and their voices must be heard and they must engage if we look at the composition of jobs in the food system, 
Of course, it's very different if you look at the high income countries to the right of the slide and the low income countries to the left. You can see that under Staples, the low income countries, 80% of all jobs are in the food system. And of course, most of that is in the farming. So about 90% of the jobs are in the farming. And the challenge is that the youth, they don't want to remain in the villages. They are drawn to the urban environments. So who's going to take over the farms? If you look at the high income, it's only 10% of the jobs in the sector. And most of that is in the food services and relatively small percentage in uh, farming. And here again, that's another challenge that for other reasons, young people are not always attracted to the farming system. And this is the background. So we have had the charge from the World Committee on Food Security to develop a report. And the charge includes to review the opportunities for and constraining factors to youth engagement and employment in agriculture and food systems, and to examine aspects related to employment, salaries, and working conditions to see what constraints there are and what opportunities we can have. What are the rules, regulations, and policy approaches that can address the complex system? And how can we explore the potential of food systems and enhance rural urban linkages to provide more and better jobs for women and youth? This is a complex diagram and I apologize for it, but it really, let me just change, uh, but it really is only one point I want to point, one thing I want to point out. This is a process of developing HLP reports. Uh, but I want to point out two things. The first one is that the key players is the CFS that gives a charge to the HLP and I'm the member of the steering committee and we manage the process. And then we appoint the project team to write a draft of the report. But there are open consultations. And I hope that many of you saw the open consultations um, second half of last year, where the draft scope is open for discussion and input from everybody over who has an interest in this issue. We've just had the first version of the report, V0, out for open consultation. And as I understand it, Sian has gotten the permission to submit comments later than the formal deadline because of the discussion today. So what we discuss here will then be fed into the process. Then a second uh, version is produced that will be peer reviewed and ev eventually we approve it. But that's just the first step of the process. Then the report goes to the committee for food security for a political discussion, which also includes civil society in the private sector. Unfortunately, the V0 draft, which is the first page, and it says very specifically, do not cite nor quote. So I can't tell you really what's in it. It's a bit strange because it's been out for open consultation uh, but I adhere to the rules and my marching orders. I can't tell you what's in this draft, uh, but Sion has it and they are going to comment on it. But I want to mention the issues to be considered in this report that we defined in the scope. The first one is, of course, why is there a need to promote youth in agriculture and food systems? And from the previous three presentations, we have very, very good and well articulated arguments for that and self-evident. Uh, second, and more importantly, and we haven't touched much on that, is how can employment in agriculture and food systems become more attractive for youth? I mentioned initially some of the challenges that we see, that agriculture and food systems aren't perceived as attractive by a large majority of youth, and we need to change that. 
So what actions are required to also equip youth with necessary skills? We've heard that before in the previous presentations. And confidence in fully engaging decision-making processes so that youth can use their agency and really influence the process and become strong actors and not just representatives. And how should the agriculture and food systems be transformed to make them more attractive to the youth? What are the best strategy for engaging youth, in particular young women, to be leaders in innovative agriculture? We need to change the systems. We know that in all countries, the challenges of Sweden are very different from Tanzania, but we all need to develop innovative approaches to this. And here, I think youth is so, such an important driving power in doing that. What are the most appropriate policies to remove obstacles and to empower you to initiate and upscale activities? And seven, what is the extent of waste discrepancy against youth, particularly young women in agriculture and food systems? So the, now is the question is how can you all engage? Because I hope you really will. This is an fantastic opportunity to have a dialogue among all the stakeholders and the policy environment in CFS to discuss the important issue of youth. I mentioned that the draft scope was up for consultation as well as the year zero and our discussions today will feed into that. But I suggest that you look at the list of members of the writing team, the project team, as well as the steering committee is easily available on the web and see, do you know someone there? Talk to them and interact with them. I think it's also extremely important to engage in the dialogue processes leading up to the UN Food Systems Summit. The first uh, Swedish dialogue was last Monday and we had an excellent exchange of ideas about what our perceptions are involving civil society, the private sector, the policymakers, and that's the hallmark of the summit to engage everybody like CFS to have all our voices heard. When the report is finished and released six months from now or so, it's been unfortunately delayed due to the COVID crisis, really take note of it, look at it, disagree with it, agree with it, discuss it, distribute it as a background to the discussion at the CFS and at the summit. We must ensure that everybody is engaged in that. There is a civil society mechanism in the CFS with a special youth group, and they've already developed a report on good examples for engaging youth in the food systems. So lots of things are happening, but there is much more to be done. And all of us are needed in that process. So engage, please. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas, for a very inspiring uh, talk. And as Thomas said, we will be reporting back to CFS some of the findings that we have today from this discussion. Uh, but Thomas, I wanted to ask you, you've been, you've been working in this field longer than most of us, and I really wanted to draw on your experience from this today. And looking historically at food systems, how do you think the role of young people has changed? And are the challenges of today different than from what we've seen earlier? Yes, I've, I've thought a bit about that. And Going back in time, I think the first time that I engaged with the issue of youth, because it's such a long time that I was a youth myself, so that I can't, can hardly remember, um, was at the World Summit uh, in 1992, where the Agenda 21 was adopted. It was in Rio de Janeiro. 
At that time, it was decided that the UN would establish a number of major groups, uh, including youth. And later on, 10 years later, I changed jobs and I led the science and technology delegation to the discussions at the UN every year with science and technology being one of the nine major groups, youth being another and farmers a third. And youth and farmers, they were not on the agenda. They, they had a very low profile. They really were not there. It was led by the private sector, science and technology, NGOs and local authorities. That is so different today where the policy environment has decided that youth is absolutely central, that youth plays a very important part in the restructuring of CS CFS, that Ziani decides to have a focus on youth in um, its annual meeting. I think there is a lot of focus on youth. We realize that we cannot develop the future without engaging and using the innovative approaches uh, and fantastic enthusiasm of youth. That has been a tremendous change. I'm trying, Ken, I, I've tried to disconnect my screen, but do you still see it? Yes, we can still see it. Matthew, can you see whether you can? I, I, um, we'll see because okay. we are actually now, thank you so much, Thomas. And we are actually now moving into a little short break. Uh, okay. It will just be two or three minutes. Uh, and during that little break, we will have another Mentimeter up here. So I'm wondering if Linda could share over your screen uh, with the questions that I would like you guys to think about during, uh, during our little break. So I would like to see you all back here uh, in two minutes. Just stand up, stretch your legs. And while you do that, go to menti.com uh, and answer this question. So how do we ensure youth's future role in food systems? Uh, the code is 5366984. And we can also post it in the chat uh, so people can just copy it in there. But see you back here in two minutes. I can see that your, your answers are popping in quickly now. We can ensure that the links between practice, knowledge, and youth participation, uh, youth technology and agroecology, and get youth engaged in safe food, capacity building, uh, and equipping them with the necessary skills. And always be sure to involve young people in everything in your planning and doing. And that's what we're trying to do here, to have a full segment of this Yana annual meeting to focus on youth, uh, not that they should be separate, but to just ensure that we give the space for these discussions and that we take the issue of youth seriously. Okay, it's really interesting ideas that we're coming in here and all of this will be uh, posted online uh, after this meeting and we will uh, try to use as much of it as possible for our reporting as well uh, back to the CFS report uh, and also from the questions that you sent in now beforehand that we will now go on to discuss with our panel. And I can see that you just continue to send in and that's really great. Thank you so much for all your great ideas that we can see here. But I think it's time for us to start again. Uh, I have a lot of questions here from the uh, from the audience to our panel that I want to ensure that we get answered. Uh, so I'm wondering if we can get, can we spotlight our panelists uh, on the screen so that we can see them. Um, the first part of this panel discussion will focus really on how can we ensure youth's future role in food systems. Um, and I want to start with with the, like the time that we're in now, with this pandemic and conversations now being held online, do you think that this has enabled youth even more uh, to be active in these dialogues? Uh, might these kind of forums be even more democratic in a way of enabling voices from youth? Um, and what issues do you see and what role could Ziani play in this as well? Anyone who wants to give it a, a first shot. Maureen, do you maybe want to start? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, 
yes, I believe that the, this online approach has been able to um, ensure that more youth are involved, but I'm also very concerned about the people who, the youth who are not able to um, access like internet, do not have access to internet and even facilities where they can be able to join these discussions. So um, I'm really wondering how they can be involved in also contributing to such um, important conversations. Hmm. Amanda, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, I think also it's a it's a mix of good and bad. I think it can be great to um, use new, I mean, new tools are coming up all the time to facilitate these kinds of discussions, which is amazing. Um, but at the same time, uh, at least what I see, and this isn't uh, specific to youth, is that if you don't already have the networks, then it can be difficult to join things. Um, particularly, I think in the in the research space, um, it's really it's really narrowed down, um, and and so I think for reaching out and engaging these new voices who want to get involved, um, it, I'm not saying it can't happen, but maybe it's a bit more difficult than running into someone after a conference and then making that connection. Mm. How do you feel with this, Anna? Do you feel like you're more connected to these forums now when everything is online and you don't have to travel to, uh, when you have to travel to uh, down to Stockholm? Yeah, like Amanda say, of course it's easier for me to like, now I can sit and have join you from the car or from wherever I are. But on the same play, on the same it's, we have still a problem. We have the new te technology, but we don't have the access maybe al always. We are not invited to the meetings always. But also we know that a lot of youths don't have the good connection, internet connection, so they can't be able to partic 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 participate in meetings and webinars because they can't use their computer. Yeah. Yeah, that's a real a, a big issue that we have to think about as well. Uh, Thomas, what, what role do you think that Ziani can play in this as a multi-sector network? Well, Ziani is an exceedingly important platform as it brings the different stakeholders together. And it's exactly those types of platforms that we need. But I also think with revolving the youth, it's very important. Someone mentioned the importance of mentors to try to ensure that you have mentors. Royal Swedish Academy of Agriculture and Forestry, for example, has a program to engage youth and develop mentors. And I've seen this in many contexts and it's very important. Um, and, and one more comment is of course that I think it was Amanda who said that you shouldn't have youth that's representatives. Well, if you look at the CFS level, how do I how do you identify youth to engage? How do you find them? Well, they have to be representatives of something because you can't just go out in the world and say who would like to contribute. So, so it's a very difficult process, and you must see it once they are representing a group, a platform, be it Siani or something else, that they then get a voice, of course. Yeah, thank you. And if any of the other panelists want to comment what anyone else says, just wave and I, I will give you the word. But we have a question here uh, from Linda Andersson at Axe Foundation, and it's to, to Maureen. Uh, and she said that in most countries, no matter if in Sweden or in Kenya, farms are shifting hands from parents to youth, and in that shift, also the how-to trickles down. However, no matter if in Sweden or Kenya, this how-to is often built on methods that worked in the past, but not geared for building sustainable food systems for future generations. So, so what is needed to excel competence, courage, and commitment for youth in agriculture to like to challenge the current how-to? Sorry, I, I lost you in the middle. I didn't hear well. Uh, so she asks, um, what is needed to excel competence, courage, and commitment for youth in agriculture and challenge the current how-to uh, in how we're doing things today? Uh, I think the first thing is for youth to show interest 
and also as Thomas and Amanda have said, um, is to try and align themselves and find people whom they can work with. Also, as we work towards uh, ensuring that these um, governments are creating an enabling environment where youth can, if they want to engage in their agriculture, they are able to take part in it through um, maybe access of seeds or farm, pro, um, farm input at a subsidized rates. Yeah, thank you. And we have uh, another question here uh, from Jeffrey Schubert, and he's wondering how the changes we have discussed this week will be implemented. Uh, we're talking about these transformation of food systems and different kind of future scenarios that we want to see and how we engage youth, but, but how should we get there? Uh, I would like to see if Amanda might want to start with answering this question and then the rest of you can feed in. Well, no easy answer. I don't have a short, concise answer for this, but I, and, and the thing is we don't have a blueprint, so there is really no answer. Um, but we know the general direction of where we need to go. Uh, we know that any solution needs to be context specific. So what works here in Sweden might not work elsewhere. What works in Northern Sweden might not work in Southern Sweden. It needs to uh, be context specific. And I think it needs to um, involve everyone. So everyone is involved in the food system, meaning we're gonna have to change a lot of hearts and minds if we really want to get to this transformational level and I think, um, I mean, we need to enable people to do that. We can't expect them to do this in, because of free will and in free time. We need to actually provide those spaces for people to engage. Um, and yeah, so I have one more point, but then it just went out of my mind, but maybe it will, <laughs> maybe it will come back. But I think we do need this hands-on uh, local approach and, and just make sure that we're actually I guess not just talking about problems or solutions, but we need to get into that middle bit. So if we don't actually talk about barriers, if we don't actually talk about differing values, if we don't actually talk about differing interests and get that out on the table, I fear that there's still going to be this gap between everyone knows problems and everyone has this long list of disconnected solutions. Yeah, does anyone else wanna come in here? No. Uh, we have a question here also for Sanna from uh, Gunilla Atrem uh, at SSNC. And she asked, how is the situation for the Samis collaborating with the regional governments in Sweden uh, concerning pastures and reindeer herding? Uh, and I could imagine that land rights must be also a central issue for, for Sami youth. Yeah, of course we have some problems and it's a lot of them. So I can't go into everyone. But, for example, we don't have the Sami and reindeer herding. We don't, on paper, we don't own the land. But for us, it's our land. Uh, but Swedish states say it's their land, and we say it's our land. Uh, so we have had some cases, and a court case, that was in the, to the highest court in Sweden. Uh, one year ago was the Girias. Samibi, who sued the Swedish state because they think they have the highest right to like to to like uh, to decide who gonna hunt and fish on their Samibi. So the Girias won, win against the Swedish state. So now it's the Girias who have the right to decide on their Samibi who have the fishing or allowed to fish and hunt. So that's one step forward that we're seeing. But we also have the like the forest companies, they need to consult with Sami bees before they, or yeah, if they are FSC certificated, then they need to consult with Sami bees and say, we want to cut these trees. But the problem is that the forestry only look at their own map and say, yeah, we just take this small place, but the Sami bees need to look at the bee bigger perspective. We need to take forestry, the hydroelectric power, the roads, and so much more. So if we try to say, no, you can't ta take that, then they came back five years later and say, but now we have waited. We don't, we need to cut this forest now. So actually, we don't have the power to say no. 
Yeah, thank you. Maureen, do you do you recognize anything from what Sanna shares here about how, how it's going in Sweden and for the Samis? How do you recognize anything this in Kenya? Ah uh, not not at all. No. Okay. Uh, we have another question here from Cedric, and this is for Thomas, and he wants to know to what extent do you think that an early career researcher can contribute to sustainable food systems, and how can they be involved in this journey? I think early career scientists are, of course, incredibly important, and I think that's where a lot of the engagement is. I can see that the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences, it really, there's a lot of drive in this. I've also been involved very much in the Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency support to build capacity in a number of bilateral countries, primarily in Africa. And we've stimulated lots of PhD students, but the problem is after they get their PhD, how they can continue to develop a scientific career. And we're just having a dialogue how we can strengthen that because that's where the problem is. They get into a lot of teaching, a lot of administration, and they very often can't build their own scientific career. So there are a number of ways where we need to address that to really have a young generation of scientists in all countries of the world that can help to provide the scientific understanding to help in political processes to engage with other stakeholders. I think this is a very important point. Yeah, thank you. I know that we have some more questions in the chat also about climate change that we will come back to later. So I'm holding on that a little bit, uh, but I wanted to hear, Ebba, do you have any uh, questions that we have received in the chat that you can ask? Yes, uh, we do have one, which could be very interesting to hear from all partners, which regards their experiences of um, organizations which they have uh, come into uh, contact with or have experience of international organizations or national organizations uh, which support uh, youth-based organizations in developing countries uh, within th this field. Uh, so it would be really nice to hear from everyone about uh, prime examples that they have encountered. Yeah, do you want to start, Thomas? And then we can take a round. Well, as I mentioned very briefly, the civil society mechanism of the Committee on World Food Security has got an outreach activity. But of course, they depend on funding. And it's very important that governments like the Swedish government realizes the importance of this and that they support this financially because the structures are there. <clears throat> it's the same thing as um, I think it was Amanda who had the list that funding of youth representatives travels is a challenge to engage in it. Yes, we need to work very hard to lift the importance. And that's why I think this HLP report is important because that gives an opportunity to stress the importance of doing exactly that. So we've got the mechanism, but primarily it's funding that's lacking. Maureen, do you want to comment on this? Yes, uh, there's also um, Global Change Makers. It's a youth-led organization that really supports um, youth that want to take part in sustainable development. Uh, maybe you can check them out. Um, it's, it's a really inspiring organization that has um, has really been instrumental in helping me and other fellow change makers. Yeah, and Sanna and Amanda, do, does any one of you want to comment on this question? Yeah, I can just give a small comment. Um, of course, like we have a lot of organizations that want to help youth. Uh, I can't uh, really list them now because I don't remember all of them. But something, something I think like the Arctic Council have helped us a lot of, but also like the Sami Council that we have. Yeah, thank you. Amanda, do you want to get in here as well? 
Uh, most of my work is in the Nordics, um, and and so I did provide some example. Um, some like WWF are, are working more broadly, obviously, than the Nordics. Um, the co-create is working more broadly, but I'm not sure I have some good examples for the regions that we we're discussing right now. So I wanted to to talk a little bit about that. We we sit here and discuss to include you. Uh, but how can we formulate what youth can bring to the table? And we also have a question from Joy that connects to this. And she wonders if, is there any data that shows that youth aren't engaged or that they don't have access today? Uh, is there anyone who wants to problematize this a bit? Maureen, maybe you have seen this in, in, in Kenya. How, how, how are youth representative there? Uh, so currently, youth representation, um, it's, it's, it's an area that is growing, but not yet there. Uh, from what I'm getting is Joy wants to get um, data on data that is showing that youth are not represented. Sorry? Joy wants to get data that shows youth are not represented. Yeah, exactly. So, so she asks, do we just assume that they don't have access and are not engaged in food systems? Or do, do, are, do they have better access than what we think? Uh, no, youth are not. They're not fully engaged. And why that I say they're not fully engaged, we find that also um, there's a lot of rural urban migration that is happening. And if youth were totally engaged in the food system value chain, they would not be migrating because, you know, why they are migrating is because they are going to look for better opportunities. So if they had opportunities that would help them thrive in the rural area, um, they would not be migrating, but they are migrating because there are no opportunities or there's no an enabling environment. I don't know if that answers the I think I think it was really good answer. And I think Thomas want to come in here now as well. No, I, I agree very much with what Maureen said. And I showed this diagram that showed that 80% of the workforce in the low income countries are in farming. But it's exactly what Maureen says. How can we make that attractive? How can we develop farming systems that are innovative and attracts them to engage? Because this is the major challenge. It's not, I think, engaging in the food systems as much as ensuring that they take over the farms from their parents with innovative approaches. And I worked in Sri Lanka many, many years ago and was exactly a few young farmers that led the way for the development of all traditional Purana village systems. And it was very impressive. So that's where the future lies and we must be able to make it more attractive. Can we try to, can we try to identify some key factors of how to do that? What, what are the key factors for, for making work in food systems and agriculture more attractive? Um, I think one way would be to uh, Im improve mechanization. There's a lot of, um, if I'm to call it hard labor that is done on the farms, more so on the farms. And also uh, to like in distribution, uh, more so of vegetables and fruits, um, inventions and more use of like cold, cold trucks that can be able to facilitate the movement. So uptake of new technology that um, youth, uptake of new technology and mechanization that youth can, um, that can attract the youth more. Oh, first Thomas, can I, and then we can yeah. use Hi, Jonathan, can I say something? Sorry, I haven't mastered the how do you lift your hand thing. This, this Is that okay if I go ahead? Uh, yeah, sure. But then we, uh, yeah, well, you can go ahead now and then we should use the chat. Okay. Yeah. What I wanted to say is that I think we have to be careful about the narrative. Um, you know, um, the situation in Kenya is not necessarily the same as in a lot of other places. It has the highest levels of education and children uh, completing secondary school. Um, it's also, there's also been a lot of debunking 
of what's called the urban advantage. So in fact, in Kenya, you have higher rates of uh, stunting and malnutrition in Nairobi than you do nationally. So it's what you actually see, I see, Maureen, in, in Nairobi is I see a huge push among youth groups in the city to try and do urban agriculture. And, uh, you, you know, that's, that's a huge thing for them. So I think, um, you know, if you look at a place like Uganda or Ethiopia, very, very few children go on to secondary school and very few complete. It's not possible to think that we can sell a kind of techie, let's use apps type of agriculture to them. We have to do other sorts of things. So I think we need to recognize the heterogeneity of the, situ of the situation. And Thomas, I want to contribute, I've been meaning to contribute to the HLPE. Um, I've had the, the thing open on my computer and want to put in some of this data. In, at ICRAF, we've really found, World Agroforestry, we've really found mixed aspirations in, in rural young people. They would like to stay in the rural area if they could make some money. Um, and, and I think they know very much that people who have left and gone to the big city in, in Kenya have not fared well. You know, there's, there's gang violence. So I think we need to nuance up this, um, this conversation a little bit. Yeah, do you want to comment on this, Maureen, before we go uh, continue with the panel? Yes, I agree. Um, uh, that programs need to be very specific to countries uh, based on where they are. Um, yes, so what I am speaking may be working for Kenya or could work for Kenya, but uh, not, may not be applied in other countries. Yeah. Yeah, Thomas, I think you had a word and then it was Sanna. Yes, of course, uh, Amanda has already pointed out that uh, the solutions need to be context specific and it varies from country to country but there was a study not very long ago about the constraints in large parts of Africa and that was for uh, there was not enough roads for them to export any surplus to the markets and there was not enough to get uh, fertilizer, et cetera, into the villages. And the change with the use of mobile phones and using that to communicate weather forecasts and market prices, et cetera, is one way. But you also need to be able to access this and get the product out from the market. And if we don't modernize that system and provide the infrastructure, it will continue in many places not to be attractive to stay in the village. Thank you. And then Sanna, I think you had your hand up as well. Yeah. And one solution can also like be to value people who, people who pr produce food higher, because now there is, I can see like people who produce food are like lower on the rank. You have study, have uh, studied at some colony university or something else and you have more knowledge uh, so we need to like to to say to people it's good that you are a food producer because you have enough of knowledge that you need you don't need anymore you don't need to go on a university for five years for having something to say you have the best knowledge about what you are doing uh, Yeah, and Amanda now has her hand up as well. Yeah, just on, on this point, because this has been discussed quite a lot at our stakeholder dialogues. Um, and I heard someone say earlier, you know, young people need to have the courage and, and motivation to do this. And um, I, I would actually say they shouldn't have to have the courage because this should be de-risked in structural ways. <laughs> um, so we see this not just with young farmers, but with, with all producers um, saying the possibilities are out there, the positive examples are out there, just switch, just do it, just have the courage, just go. Uh, it, it doesn't, it doesn't work like that. Uh, you have to have support mechanisms from, from governments, businesses can help, uh, they need to de-risk it, they need to make sure that People have access to assets, land and machines and, and whatever technology they need, 
they need to have uh, and, and real financial support mechanisms. So those are those are some things that um, perhaps public sector could could help with. Yeah, thank you. I think we have a few more questions from the live chat now, uh, but maybe you want to come in. Uh, I think we have time to take one or two uh, before we have to move on uh, to our last questions and then invite in Katarina. But Ebba, are you here? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, we can take one from our own Siani Madeleine uh, Fogda. And uh, this one regards attracting uh, young people to agriculture and agri-food systems. And she asks, um, a attraction to sector of, uh, sector of opportunities, more so in countries where agriculture is on the pathway to transformation, but yet we fail to attract young people. Uh, we hear about green jobs in the transformation um, of the agriculture and forestry sectors. Uh, but yes, how do we include um, young people and attract them? And uh, we've touched upon these topics. I think it would also be nice to hear a, a kind of nuance here surrounding how we also attract persons beyond the school age. Because Maureen, for example, you talked uh, about how education is vital. But how do we encourage people who may have gone off from school or who are now in university or you know have left for other types of jobs yeah maureen do you want to to answer this question yes uh so one way would also be to like right now the un food system summit is up it's upcoming later in the year and um the, there's a web there's a part where you can want you can sign up to get engaged to get engaged in the UN food system summit uh, in terms of either holding a dialogue also or also becoming a food system champion and a hero uh, so the, as I said before there are various ways in which um, uh, you can get engaged one it could also be something as simple as also sharing knowledge what you have and also committing or um, or in committing to uh, something like um, you will make better food choices or you will uh, support your, 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 you will buy um, food from maybe a young farmer whom you know is, uh, is, is practicing agriculture, for example. So right, so my call to action is right now uh, for the UN Food System Summit. Uh, I am, I invite everyone to go uh, and um, sign up in the Engage tab and see any small way in which you can get part involved in the food system. Great suggestion, thank you. Uh, and I see that we are sure. Uh, sure uh, can't speak anymore. I see that we sh uh, are slowly running out of time here. Uh, and I have one more question. Uh, and then after that question, I will do a round with the panel where I will ask all of you to, to ask yourself the question that I have missed asking you today. Uh, but before we do that round, I wanted to talk about a thing that I don't think we have touched upon uh, enough today. And that is climate change, which is sort of a little bit of the elephant in the room here. Uh, and we have seen youth taking the streets all over the world, demanding action on climate change. Uh, Amanda, you spoke a little bit about this also in your intervention. And I wanted to hear about your thoughts on climate change and food systems and what, uh, what challenges this pose to youth in food systems. Uh, and maybe Samna, uh, you would like to start of this because I know that uh, the reindeer herding is directly affected by this. Yeah, I can start to try to explain a little bit. It's a long really it's gonna take the whole time if i explain everything but climate change is nothing that we're gonna have in the future climate change we have already now up here we see how rangers are going through ices because the lakes that they usually move on they have no ice because the temper the temperature is so warming more and more so instead of like going on ice they go on water and the ice broke so now they die because of that but also we can see that uh, 
the weather aren't that usually would be. Uh, today I have cold, but some days ago we have really warm. Uh, and these temperature changes for the rangers make that it can't find food or it's, if it's too much snow, it's hard for them also to find, find, find the lichen that they eat on the ground. Uh, but it's not only like affecting rangers, you can see how it's affecting the whole Sami culture. For example, we have over 100 years for describing the snow in Sami language. But when we don't have the snow condition, so these words we're going to lose because we're gonna, not going to have that snow anymore. That was just a little short. Yeah, thank you. Do you, do you guys think that we will see people take into the streets as a done with climate change, but for food systems in the future? Is this the new movement that we might see? Sana is, is nodding. <laughs> I don't see any more hands up. Uh, so I would like to take this last round now with a panel um, and ask you if you were the moderator of this session, what question would you have asked yourself and then provide an answer? And that will then be the last word from, from this panel before we let Katarina in to give the concluding remarks. And Thomas, I thought we should go the other way now so that you would start this. Thank you. Yes, as a moderator, I would have asked me that you've talked about the high level panel report and the discussions at the level of the UN, but how can we ensure that report reflects a multitude of conditions and reality so that it doesn't become too abstract? because I see this as a challenge all the time is my response, because it really is to link the local to the global. In all these discussions, when we deal with complex systems, how do you take that into account? And in the past, we've solved this partly by having good examples. And I mentioned the CFS report and good examples of engaging youth. And I think we can hope to reflect that in report so that we can stimulate each other because there is not one solution. Uh, and we also, as several have said, uh, Maureen talked about it now most recently, and that's to use the existing and developing platforms for dialogue. And if I can give one example, from the climate change area, since I chaired the CGIR climate change agriculture and food security program for many years, we developed the concept of climate smart agriculture to develop, to have demonstrations in villages involving everybody in the village to develop climate smart solutions. Then take the farmers from those villages to other parts, say for example, in Africa, where the current climate is what their climate will be perhaps 20 years from now and have a dialogue again to really go down to reality and use examples, I think is extremely important. Uh, and that's where we have to work much more on getting that. And it's the same thing for the scientific community. When, when I work for CCAFs, the scientists didn't very much engage in working with the farmers directly. They, we very often use the NGOs to work in the farming community. And again, we have to change that, to use more transdisciplinary approaches where the problem is identified together with the stakeholders and then the research is done and the results are communicated. So involvement from the beginning, I think it's essential. And that can then feed us good examples up to the global UN level. Thank you. Uh, Sanna, do you want to give it a try? Yeah, uh, I have solved a lot of problems. So if I would be the moderator, I would ask myself, why are you still fighting? in the future look so bad. Uh, and I know a lot of youths that uh, still think that we have a future, because if we try to have a future, why are we still fighting? And if me and my friend, now it says I have bad 
Hector, do you hear me now? Jonathan, maybe. I can't hear you. If you oh, sorry. Uh, I think the connection is a bit bad. So maybe we try to go to Marina, then come back to you right after, because it was breaking up a little bit. Uh, sorry about that. It, it might help. So Marina, if you go first, and then we go back to Sana. OK. So um, that's an interesting question. So if I was a moderator, the question I would ask myself is, as I am busy uh, or I'm trying to get youth to get involved in the food system, uh, what role am I playing? And how I would answer myself is I have, I have taken it upon myself to raise awareness of what um, the food system is and what nutrition is all about because I believe each one of us has a role to play. Um, there's, there are no small contributions or small um, um, ideas or solutions that we can give. And um, finally is to remind myself and everyone that uh, we require nutrients every day. And the moment it is now time for us to build back and to build back a stronger food system and ensure that um, whatever we eat and how, whatever we use to nourish our body is not only beneficial to ourselves, but also uh, uh, um, friendly to our planet and we are taking care of our planet. Thank you. We'll try to go back to Sanna and see if the connection is better now. Yeah, do you hear me now? Yes, now we hear you. Yeah, I have talked a lot of problem about problems. So I would ask myself, why are you still fighting when the future looks so bad? And I think the easy answer is because we are a lot of youths that still think that we have a future. That's why we are en engaging or engaging us in different things, because we still see that we have a future. If I don't trust that I have a future, then I just can give up now. But it's so much more than just a work that I'm doing. Like my and my friends that also are ranger herders see so much more. It's the love for the ranger, the culture, the nature. It's hard to explain why we still want to live this life that we are living. But I see also to be a little bit to end this with not, no problems. I see that there are many youths that want to do change, and I see that like youths are making changes now and trying to get to their voice. So we need to make decisions and we don't have the time to wait. Thank you, Sanna. Uh, and over to you, Amanda. Thanks. Um, so I had a question prepared, but then I was searching through the chat and saw someone um, posted a really interesting question. So I'm going to uh, hopefully answer that one and, and um, get two with one here. So they were asking in terms of, do I think it's more of a bottom up movement, like a youth movement or a top down more governmental approach that's going to fix food systems. Um, and I think that the, the answer is of course going to be, it's going to be a mix of both. So policymakers need to be pressured by these movements and know that demand is shifting and um, that people are demanding change. Uh, but they, unfortunately, for better or for worse, right now they hold a lot of um, they hold a lot of power. And you could include businesses in this as well. Business, government, top-down changes. They hold a lot of power in the current structure, um, and and they need to take responsibility. I mean, with power comes responsibility. We hear this all the time. And, uh, and actually structurally change the system to enable that the, these changes that uh, so many different movements are wanting. So probably maybe an unsatisfying answer, but it will need to be a mix of top down, bottom up and everything else coming in at the middle. <laughs> I think that was a, a good ending note for this discussion. Thank you so much to all of you. I think it's been really interesting. I, I would have wished that we had way more time but i think that's always uh, the case but thank you so much for participating uh, and i know a lot of people in the chat have asked for your contact information etc so if you are happy to engage please just post in the chat so people can get in contact with you after this seminar as well 
And now we have one more person with us that has a great insight into the preparation for the Food Citizen Summit on a governmental level. And that is Katarina Wahlgren from the Swedish Ministry of Enterprise and Innovation. And she will now give an intervention looking at the year ahead and present some of Sweden's priorities. Uh, Katarina, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Do you have my picture? Yes, I ready? think Matthew will Good. put up your presentation. Yes. I have the first picture, please. Yes, it's coming. There you have it. Thank you. Yeah. My name is, like you see, Katarina Wahlgren, and I work at the Ministry for Enterprise and Innovation in the animal and food division. And mainly I work with nutrition and sustainable food consumption and with the preparations for Food Systems Summit. Unfortunately, I have not had the opportunity to listen to all the previous speakers all the time. So I'm sorry for that. Uh, I know you have had very interesting discussions as I can understand I listened the last minutes. Uh, I will try now to make an update of the government's work before the Food Systems Summit. Picture two, please. Next picture. Uh, all member states uh, have been called upon to organize three national dialogue meetings on food systems. And the first one took place in Sweden on the 25th of January. Some of you may, may have been on that meeting, I presume. Uh, the day started with a seminar organized by the government offices, the Royal Swedish Academy of Forestry and Agriculture and CIANI where the Swedish FAO committee's latest publication, Sustainable Food Systems, Knowledge, Innovation and Cooperation was launched. And it will soon be published in English. So please try to get hold of that one. It's very interesting. Uh, the seminar helped them to lay the foundation for the Swedish National Dialogue, which took place in the afternoon. About 70 representatives from government agencies civil society, the private sector, industry organizations, academia, academia, and other participated in the dialogue to contribute their perspectives. And the dialogue revolved around 10 visions that were designed to enable as broad a discussion as possible. And there will be at least two more dialogues in Södertälje and Hanusand. And uh, also I heard there will be one made uh, organized by the, the WWF and probably by CEDA as well. Uh, and the ministry has also launched a mailbox for these dialogues where participants can make their thoughts. And bringing out and doing a dialogue, it's free for everyone to make up one. It's, it's one of the thoughts behind a food system summit. There would be that there would be a lot of dialogues around the world. Next picture, please. Next picture. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, within the EU, so-called council conclusions that will constitute the EU's position before the summit must be adopted. And these are now being discussed and they are expected to be decided by the AgriFish ministerial meeting in April. And the work of preparing these is done in the council working group of the FAO but several other working groups are affected, not least the groups for development policy and the environment. Next picture. Then it comes to action track two. Five action tracks have been decided, which will provide support to achieve the Food System Summit's broader vision to contribute to achieving the global goal goals. Sweden is one of 12 countries, part of the steering group for action track two shifting to sustainable and healthy consumption patterns. And yesterday we had the second meeting in that group and there are three work streams planned to take part, to, to be part of that. One is about food environment to create healthy, safe and sustainable food environments to enable people to adopt and maintain healthy dietary practices. The second is food demand to improve product experience of healthier, more sustainable food and improve consumer motivation and capability. And the third one is food waste, to halve food waste at food service, retail and household level and transition to circular food economy. Uh, it's only the food waste group that has really started the work and will have its first meeting in the beginning of March. And Sweden will be represented by people from the Swedish Food Agency. 
So we are still waiting for the two others to start up. And the next picture, please. Uh, as this day to day that you're organizing is concerning youth, uh, there is uh, in the frame of Action Track 2 plans to, to organize a policy boot camp for youths. And it will take place on the 2nd of March and it will only last for four hours. And this idea of a policy boot camp, it's a model that seeks to introduce systems thinking into participatory policy consumption process. And the boot camp was developed as an action research methodology to expose participants to ways to apply and combine multiple analytical tools from different disciplines in an integrated fashion. And this boot camp that Sweden has now the opportunity to participate in is organized by Cambridge University in collaboration with EAT in early March. And it will be, of course, a digital meeting. And the plan is it will be for about 50 children and young people in the age between 13 and 25 years, 25, 25 of them from Sweden and 25 from a country in Global South. Not yet decided which country though. This will be a kind of, we would say, a, a creative way of discussing a challenge. They will have group discussions and they will try to submit proposals and ideas for solutions on the challenge. And uh, during the discussions, there will be 10 experts from different areas and they will present they will be present there to inspire the youths and to answer questions, of course. Uh, the Swedish challenge, we had the opportunity to choose the challenge and it will be a Swedish challenge. It might be a challenge for other countries as well. It's uh, food environments. How can you get consumers to change their choices to become healthier and more sustainable? Uh, a background to this challenge is that we had a dietary survey that was carried out a few years ago in Sweden by our national food agency in the age uh, in, in Sweden, in children in the age of 11, 14 and 17. And this survey shows that the consumption of fruits and vegetables has become better during the last years, but still it is too low. While the consumption of red and processed meat is too high, it showed that one fifth of the adolescents were overweight or obese, and it also showed that adolescents with parents with lower educational attainment and or lower income consume less vegetables and fish and more sugary drinks. So there is a close connection there. They also made another smaller survey and it was done among adolescents in the age of 17 that were not being in school or not having a work. And that one showed that their eating habits were even worse. Unfortunately, this group was statistically too small, but still my own conclusion is that school meals are very important when it comes to healthy eating habits. In general, school meals are pretty good in Sweden, but schools can probably do much more to reach more sustainable eating habits. And therefore one had to look at the food, the whole food environment. Why do children and and adolescents meet, uh, what do uh, children and adolescents meet outside school? What do they meet in shops, in public transports, in the city and villages? What do they meet when doing sport activities and at sport events and other events? What kind of food is offered? What do we find? Where do we find the fast food? And what is the supply in the fast food restaurants? There are so much to look upon and we have to look at the whole food environment. This challenge, seeking solutions, there must be a guiding principle that no one should be left behind. The challenge in this book camp should focus on the most vulnerable groups in society and on the most unsustainable consumers. And like I said, the focus should be on how we design society and food environments so that it is easy to choose the right food and consume just the right amount. Today, not everyone has the opportunity to make conscious choices. Even if it is possible, even if this possibility exists, it is not certain that the knowledge influences the decision sufficiently. Information is just a piece of the puzzle in the whole. And hopefully 
the results of this boot camp. It's only four hours, but hopefully it is very creative. We contribute to the work in Action Track 2 and to the work in this field in Sweden for the government's work. And I can mention that other countries have already showed interest in doing a similar thing like the boot camp in their, own, in their countries. And we can go to the next picture. Yeah, I would like to end by mentioning the voluntary guidelines on food systems and nutrition. Uh, this is an important cr contribution to the summit and they're being developed within the framework of the Committee on Food Security, CFS. Uh, these negotiations with the guidelines have been difficult and extensive, among other things. The countries have had different views on the issue of antibiotics resistance, for instance, how to express oneself about sustainability and what nutritious diet is. I haven't been involved myself in, this, in these negotiations. It's a colleague of mine. And this week, the last round of negotiations has taken place and the hope is that the process has been completed. If all goes well, these guidelines will be adopted by the Committee on Food Security at its meeting on the 8th and 12th February. So finally, I'd just like to say that CFS is also adopting a so-called terms of reference for voluntary guidelines for gender equality in food security. And that product will arrive during the year and be negotiated in 2022. This work will be led by Finland. And it is a priority for Sweden and we have also made a financial contribution to carry out that work. Thank you. Thank you, Katharina, uh, for this presentation and really interesting with this uh, policy bootcamp. I just wanted to ask you, uh, we have discussed here about youth engagement uh, in, uh, ahead of the Food System Summit and ahead of CFS today. And how do you think that Sweden as an actor can, can ensure that youth are heard uh, at these two forums? Uh, I think, if, first of all, we have, we have this booth camp, but it's only for 25 youths. On the other hand, it will be a broad, uh, I think, uh, marketing for the event in social media. So young people get aware of what is going on and they will have an, a questionnaire to send in and uh, where from the Cambridge University will choose the delegates to the booth camp. But, I, I hope that a lot of youths do the questionnaire because they're interested and just by doing so, it's one step ahead. We get some ideas from, I guess. And uh, the other part is the dialogues. We have the national dialogues. Um, we have the WWF organizing one, I hope. And I mean, it's open for other organizations to have their own dialogues and they can all contribute into the FSS by sending in what they have come, what they have been discussed, discussing. Thank you, Katharina. I feel that we all are really ready to go out there now and to get to work. And I hope that yeah. you in the audience also feel as inspired as I do. Uh, thank you again for participating thank here you. today. Uh, and following this event, there will be a web story on Siani's website, as well as a recording of this session. So to anyone you know that could not participate here today, please ask them to go to siani.se to rewatch. Uh, and after this session, I will also send out a short survey, and it would be great if you could help us answer this survey so we know how we can be better next time uh, and continue to improve our work at Siani. So thank you so much for attending today. I will now give the word to Madeleine Fogde, who's the director of Siani, and she will close the Siani annual meeting. Thank you and over to Madeleine. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Jonathan, and all the speakers for this uh, last session in the Siani annual meeting, which we have organized for the first time virtually, with a great success, I would say. We have had almost 900 signing up, but maybe about a half uh, or 400 uh, participating in our dialogues coming in and out. So we, we count that as a big success. And we I think you will see more of our members and followers meeting online in the future. So thank you all for uh, confirming that this was a good go. 
Um, we started out the, our meeting with looking at the food system and listening to voices that we really need to listen to if we are going to talk about the transformation so that we ensure that we actually don't, do not leave anyone behind. And uh, yesterday we had a very interesting session about communication and there we also got really good insights and uh, understood that words really counts. We have to be very careful when we choose words. We have to, we should transmit evidence-based information and make it comprehensive for the one we want to reach. And also, of course, we should always be careful sharing pictures of this is an issue of rights. Now, um, today we have had a very interesting conversation about how we can integrate youth, how we give them space, how we ensure empowerment. And uh, <clears throat> it, it, there has been said that it's very important with long-term engagement. And uh, Siani, as also as a young actor and player, has now been going on since 2009. And we hope to continue with you to be an active uh, uh, platform for this long-term engagement. We don't know. Uh, however, we would like to to thank people like Thomas Rossal, who has been with us from the start and uh, supported us and helped us to grow. And that shows how important it is to have very good and competent mentors so that we can actually give, take space and uh, be an active partner. Uh, yes, and um, so this year we, as a network, will continue to engage and uh, in share information about food system. We will have a special space on our work, website where you can get information about recent research on food system, good practices, and also information on what's happening in the preparation of the food system summit. We continue to work with youth and how we engage them uh, uh, so that they can take place and so that, that they can be listened to. And um, we all encourage you members and followers to take part of all the hearings that are planned and taking place up to the Food System Summit. If you are young or old, you need to be engaged. Uh, your experience count. We heard that local experience can le lead to global change. So your case, your research, your story are important in this process. And for you young, be sure of that your future is super important because it's all our future and for you to recommend. So we are in this together and we should be up to the summit and beyond, of course. Yeah, uh, to get the, if we get the food system right, we can get so many other things right. So many other SDGs we can um, manage to achieve when we get it right. And not least, of course, the SDG number two, which is zero hunger. And uh, so I really hope for engagement and joining us in this uh, venture. Um, engage with us online, uh, engaging us in physical dialogues and meetings, read us, read our publication, follow social media, participate in surveys coming out from us. We are being evaluated, so we want to know what you think about us and how you experience engaging with us. And thank you then, uh, all the speakers, all through these three very exciting meetings that composed the Siani meeting <laughs> during half a week. Uh, and uh, thank you all members and followers from near and far, being loyal to us and newcomers for joining and for sharing and being very active. We have saved all the chats. We have saved all the information on Mentimeter. We worked on this and you will see reports coming out on what happened this week on our website. And uh, thank you all enablers of Siani. Here I refer to SEI, our host organization, SIDA, the Swedish government, our steering committee led by Annika, who we met uh, on the first meeting. And of course, millions and millions of thanks to my excellent team uh, who have been so enthusiastic and worked hard long nights and early mornings to get this organized. And with this word, I really, I uh, would like to close the Siani annual meeting 2021, but I would like to continue to see you all this year and engage with you as much as possible. So thank you very much from Siani in Storahult, Sweden, home office. Bye. Bye for now. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.